Well, let's see if we can draw the mechanism for this reaction. Assuming it's going to proceed E2. Yeah, that's good. That's right. But, uh, I, for some reason, I'm drawing a blank on the mechanism of E2. Right? And we should go through that. OK, but it's good that you saw it would be E2. So it's good that you labeled the alpha carbon here. Um, so here's our alpha carbon. Is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? Primary. Now, we know that in our table, there's actually two different rows for primaries based on how much steric hindrance there is on, this, on the beta carbon. Um, but you saw that the beta carbon here was secondary. Um, and we only have to go into that special row for a tertiary beta carbon. So we're just going to deal with the normal row for a primary alpha carbon. Uh, and then who is our nucleophilic atom? The negative oxygen. Right. So it's good that you're now in the habit of saying not just the atom, but the charge. So notice that we're not in that poor nucleophile category anymore. The poor nucleophile was a neutral oxygen. This is a way better nucleophile because of the charge. Okay. All right. Um, and things get a little complicated here, though, because you can see that the oxygen with a negative charge kind of has two columns. Oxygen with a negative charge has two columns based on whether it's part of something bulky or non-bulky. Um, well, what does this look like, bulky or non-bulky? Oh, well, first of all, it doesn't look like anything because it's not a real compound. All right, this is a real compound. I forgot this carbon here. So you want to make sure for your notes that you put this carbon here between the metals and the oxygen. Right. OK, so now that this is a real compound with this new carbon, uh, does it look bulky or non-bulky? Bulky. Yeah, it should look very bulky because it doesn't look that bulky because it's in condensed notation. But if I wrote it out, there would be three whole methyl groups waving around here. In fact, this is as bulky as you can get. Okay. This has these three whole methyl groups waving around. So this is very bulky. All right, and that's how we know it's going to be E2. Right? right? Because we're in the, the rightmost column. Well, the rightmost column you can see is pretty much always E2. Definitely it's going to be an E2 with a primary substrate. So we're definitely going to have an E2 here. So you can see if you have an O minus or an N minus, you then have to check how bulky the uh, attacker is. Why does that matter? Why can't we do an SN2 here? Well, what was the big obstacle to SN2? Uh, the big obstacle to SN2 is uh, steric hindrance blocking the nucleus. Right. Now, we've already seen that <coughs> steric hindrance could come from the substrate. Well, that's not an issue here. There isn't much steric hindrance from the substrate. But steric hindrance can come from the nucleophile itself. Mm -hmm. This is so bulky itself, it's going to get in its own way. Okay. This is, has got so many methyl groups waving around, it's going to get in its own way. These methyl groups will block the oxygen from joining the substrate here. OK. okay. All right. So um, because of that, we're not going to be able to do an SN2 here. In fact, you can see that bulky bases can almost never do SN2. Bulky bases almost never do SN2 because they've got too much steric hindrance. You can see that from uh, the table. So you were right, this is going to be E2. By the way, one of the lessons here then is steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2. Steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2. In fact, we're not really going to learn a big obstacle to E2. Uh, there isn't any interesting big obstacle to E2. Um, but this isn't going to do SN2 because of the steric hindrance. And since steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2, we'll do the E2. You can see that steric hindrance is not a big obstacle to E2 if you look at the table. Because notice that E2 can work on any substituted substrate, even tertiary. You can still do an E2 even on a tertiary substrate, which has tons of steric hindrance. So steric hindrance can't be a big obstacle to E2. OK. All right, so we're going to do an E2 reaction, which you correctly figured out. And the part that was giving you trouble was the mechanism. So let's go through that. This is probably, well, one of the most complicated mechanisms you'll see this term. This is actually a pretty complicated mechanism. Um, so uh, who does it make sense to put, well, um, who does it make sense to put at the tail of the arrow? The oxygen. Don't put that at the tail. The, the, the negative charge. Yeah, the that's right. Good. Now, what is this oxygen going to act as? Well, something with a negative charge can be either a nucleophile or a base. Mm -hmm. This is a complication in, in OCHEM. Something with a negative charge can act either as a nucleophile or as a base. Both bases and nucleophiles donate electrons. So this could be either a nucleophile or a base. Uh, well, we've already kind of figured out which one it is. If you're doing a substitution reaction, 
are you using a nucleophile or a base? You're using a nucleophile. Right. And if you're doing an elimination reaction, you're using a base. Right. So if you're doing SN1 or SN2, you're using an, uh, a nucleophile. But if you're doing E1 or E2, you're using a base. What's the difference between those? Well, they both donate electrons, but a nucleophile is somebody who donates electrons to join the alpha carbon. A nucleophile is somebody who donates electrons to join the substrate. A base is somebody who donates electrons to steal a, to steal a hydrogen. That's the basic difference between them. They both donate electrons, um, but the uh, nucleophile donates electrons as a way of joining the substrate, and the base donates electrons as a way of stealing a hydrogen. You already learned in chemistry that bases steal hydrogens. Yes. A base is someone who takes a hydrogen. Well, we decided this was going to be an E2 reaction. So is the oxygen going to act as a nucleophile or a base? A base. So is it going to join the substrate or take a proton? It's going to pluck up a, it's going to pluck a hydrogen. Right. Now here's where people get messed up because they can't figure out which hydrogen to take. It turns out it's going to take, sorry? The beta. That's right. There you go. It doesn't take an alpha hydrogen. It takes a beta hydrogen. So who should go at the head of this arrow? The beta hydrogen. So this is another good argument for labeling the beta carbon over here. Anytime you're doing an E2, you should label both the alpha and the beta. All right, and now we're going to have a whole series of arrows. So can we come up with the remaining arrows? Well, first of all, a hydrogen cannot be bonded to more than one thing. So if the hydrogen is forming the bond to the oxygen, it must be losing this bond. So I have to put this bond at the tail of an arrow, and I have to figure out a good place to put those electrons. Where can I put the electrons from that bond? So your guess is it would go like this. That's not a bad guess. Let's think about that a little bit more. Is this going to be a substitution or an elimination reaction? Oh, it's going to double bond. To the That's right. Carbon. It's going to be an elimination reaction. Because what is an elimination reaction? An, eliminary, an elimination reaction, by definition, is a reaction that forms a pi bond. That's actually an important thing to have in our notes. An elimination reaction. is a reaction that forms a pi bond. That's an important definition to have memorized. Elimination reaction is a reaction that forms a pi bond. Okay. Um, a substitution reaction is something that just substitutes one atom for another. But an elimination reaction is a reaction that forms a pi bond. So we have a very good purpose to put these electrons in the bond to. We can put them to form a pi bond here. But that gives us another difficulty, because that means that this alpha carbon is going to be forming a new pi bond, but the alpha carbon already has a complete octet. So it's going to have to lose some electrons. Well, fortunately, it has a good leaving group. That's what makes it the alpha carbon. So here's why I said this is maybe the most complicated reaction you'll see this term, because there's three simultaneous arrows. Three simultaneous arrows, and, and you have to think carefully about each one. The first arrow is when the base is stealing the beta hydrogen. That frees up the electrons that the beta hydrogen used to have in the bond to form the new pi bond. Okay. And that kicks off the leaving group. So we have to see this a couple times before we get comfortable with it. This um, is all happening in one step. And it all happens in one step. How many steps are there in an E2 reaction? Just like uh, for an SN2. S E2 and e SN2 are pretty similar. They're both one step reactions. So you can see the number two is kind of misleading. Uh, E2 and SN2 actually have only one step. OK. All right, now that we have the arrows in here, we should be able to draw the products. The arrows tell us what the products look like. So let's take our time and see if we can draw the right products. That is correct. You didn't sound too confident of that, but that's right. It's good that you worked that out. <clears throat> now, the best way to do this is the one atom at a time technique. So we can number the atoms. So say, starting over here, who is the number one attached to? Uh, to the number two. 
And who's the number two going to be attached to? Now, a better answer would be it's going to be attached to the number three with both a sigma and a pi bond. Okay. And how do we know? This arrow here tells us that we're forming this pi bond. And we know that the number two is not attached to this hydrogen anymore because of this arrow. We might not have drawn the hydrogen anyway because it's a hidden hydrogen. There still is a hydrogen on the number two, but it's hidden, so maybe we won't draw it. Uh, is the number three attached to anybody that we haven't drawn yet besides hidden hydrogens? No. Because of this arrow. 